Hello world, this is Random Fix, and in this video today we're going to be discussing the Isuzu drive cycle procedure. We're going to be using this OBD2 reader right here that costs under $30. I'll have a link to it in the video description down below. You can find the connector for your vehicle under your driver's side footwell area. Mine's this white connector right here, and I'll show you guys what yours looks like. And once you slide the connector on, you'll get power to the unit. And once the unit has power, go ahead and turn the vehicle ignition on and make sure your engine is not running. And now you can go ahead and use that little scan tool and check the monitors on your vehicle. And you can confirm that you're ready to pass your emissions test. And I'll show you how to do this now. And before we jump into the drive cycle, check out the Smog Tips playlist. And once you click on the playlist, you can actually watch the whole drive cycle in process where I'm going to show you how to do this on the road. And if you need further assistance on how to understand these inspection monitors, check out this video titled What to Do to Smog a Car. Hello world, this is Random Fix. In this video today, I'm going to be discussing the Isuzu drive cycle. So if you have a 1996 and newer Isuzu, I'm going to show you how to complete the drive cycle and get your monitors ready so you can pass an emissions test. Before we dive into the actual emissions test, there's some basic vocabulary we need to learn here. When OBD2 is referenced in the video, please know that it refers to the onboard diagnostics type 2. And this started in 1996. And before 1996, each vehicle manufacturer had their own port and it was all a big old mess. So after 1996, it became really easy. For $30, you could buy a little OBD2 reader and you could scan mostly any vehicle that's 1996 and newer. And with that scan tool, you could check the inspection monitors and you could also get DTCs, which are diagnostic trouble codes. And for the engine control module, for example, there's pending codes and hard set codes. Hard set codes are ones that actually trigger the check engine light. The vehicles verify the issue. And a pending code is one where the code is not fully detected and the vehicle knows about it, it just needs more information. However, if you have a check engine light that's turning on within milliseconds of the engine cranking, you know you probably have a damaged sensor, damaged wiring, there's something that's causing an open circuit in that vehicle. So you definitely need to get that fixed before you actually jump into the drive cycle here. Because no matter how many times you do the drive cycle, Unless you get that problem fixed, this will not work. MIL stands for a malfunction indicator light, AKA the check engine light, service engine light, the service engine soon light. When you're using an OBD2 reader, you might say okay on the display. This is the same exact thing as complete, set, and ready. INC is short for incomplete, unset, and not ready. NA basically means it's not applicable. So if you see a monitor and it says NA next to it, go ahead and skip that monitor. And here's five monitors that are listed here in order. And this is the order that they normally set in. So the very first monitor that normally sets is going to be the oxygen sensor heater monitor. And this monitor is super important because the oxygen sensor heater actually helps the oxygen sensor get up to speed faster so the vehicle can do a better job of its emissions. Then we have the oxygen sensor itself. And on most late model vehicles, even on a four cylinder vehicle, you have at least two oxygen sensors. So you have one that's before the catalyst called the pre-cat or upstream oxygen sensor. And you have one after the cat that's called the post-cat or downstream oxygen sensor. We have the EGR monitor. We have the catalyst monitor here. And the last monitor to normally set is called the EVAP monitor. 
And EVAP is short for Evaporative Emissions Control Systems. And in short, the EVAP system keeps the gas fumes out of the atmosphere. And as a helpful tip, you want to go ahead and use a stopwatch while you're doing this test because it'll make it a lot easier. Some technical parameters that we need to cover. You want to ensure that the check engine light is really off and there's nothing stored in the memory of the vehicle. You want to have the gas level between a quarter to three quarters. Three quarters is recommended. Park on level ground overnight before you conduct the test. Avoid sudden acceleration, sharp turns, or sudden braking. I like to avoid hills, that way the fuel doesn't just slosh around in the back and delay the EVAP system from getting ready. You want to ensure your battery is good, your alternator is good, and you have good grounds on all the major components. So if you have a vehicle that's not getting ready, look at the battery, make sure that the battery and the charging system are correct. All accessories, including the rear defroster and the light should be off. The AC should be off as well. And avoid extreme temperatures, rough roads, because some extreme conditions can keep the monitors from becoming ready. The night before you complete the procedure, go ahead and take the keys out of the ignition and lock the door. And make sure if you have one of the newer Isuzu's that can actually detect the keys, that you take those keys far away from the vehicle so the vehicle actually goes into a deep sleep. Because if it doesn't, some of the monitors like the oxygen sensor heater monitor may not run. So this is the drive cycle procedure here for the Isuzu. And again, we need a cold start, fuel level at three quarters of a tank, park on level ground, no AC or cruise. And this is just a simple five step process here. So we're gonna begin off with starting the engine and just letting it idle in park for 15 minutes. You wanna make sure that the rear defroster is off, AC is off, radio is off, and make sure that the engine cooling temperature is gonna be about 160 degrees. So when your temperature gauge is actually in the middle, you know you've reached 160 degrees. And make sure when you're doing step one here that you don't move the vehicle, you don't touch the gas pedal. You just wanna put the key in the ignition, start it, and let it idle for 15 minutes. Step two. We're going to accelerate to speeds between 40 to 55 miles an hour using coral throttle. Make sure we drive on a very flat level road and keep that speed constant for at least five minutes and make sure you're in the highest gear. So if you have a manual transmission, you want to be in the fifth or sixth gear. Step three, you want to go ahead and slow down and this is very important the way you slow down. So what you want to do is remove your foot off the gas pedal and coast to under 20 miles an hour without touching the brake pedal or shifting gears. Once you're under 20 miles an hour, you want to go ahead and come to a complete stop by using the brakes. And once you're stopped, go ahead and let the vehicle idle in gear for one minute. So that'd be D for Automatic transmissions and manual transmissions, go ahead and leave it in neutral. And then you want to do an additional minute in park. And if you have a manual transmission, go ahead and leave it in neutral. You want to turn the engine off. You want to wait one minute. And after a minute, you want to go ahead and restart the motor. After the motor is restarted, you want to go ahead and accelerate again to speeds between 40 to 55 miles an hour using a quarter throttle and maintain that speed for at least two minutes in the highest gear. And in step five, we're gonna slow down again, but this time we're gonna go ahead and use the brakes to slow down. And once you've come to a complete stop, go ahead and let the vehicle idle again in gear for one minute so drive for automatic transmissions in neutral for manual transmissions then we're going to go ahead and do an additional minute in park turn the engine off wait one minute and after the minute is up you want to turn the ignition on 
use that OBD2 reader that I showed you in the very beginning of the video and check the monitors for the drive cycle. And when you get back from your test drive, you want to scan it. And if everything is done, it'll say zero codes incomplete, seven that are complete, and four that don't apply, and zero codes found. And this is a 100% chance that you're going to go ahead and pass your emissions tests as long as you haven't altered anything on your vehicle. And your vehicle passes the visual inspection as well, which I'll cover a little bit later. As a helpful tip, only focus on the unset monitors. So if your EVAP is not set, you want to focus on activities that help the EVAP get set, like parking on level ground and making sure that the fuel is not less than a quarter tank and no more than three quarters of a tank, avoiding those hills, avoiding the sudden turns, sudden braking, sudden acceleration. And if your catalyst isn't set, you want to focus more on the high-speed driving, such as in steps two and four. If your EGR is not set, you want to focus more on the coasting during your everyday drives. So you want to coast to speeds of under 20 miles an hour and then use the brake. If your oxygen sensor and oxygen sensor heater are not ready, you want to focus more on steps one. Basically, let, make sure that the vehicle is properly warmed up. I like to let the vehicle warm up an extra couple of minutes, especially in some of the colder months. And if you ever run into a situation where your oxygen sensor or your oxygen sensor heater are not getting ready, what I sometimes like to do is go ahead and look at the connector and you don't need any special tools for this. Just go and unplug the connector for the oxygen sensor. Grab yourself some electrical cleaner. And what you can do is spray the contacts. Make sure that the contacts are really good. And they're not covered in dirt or gunk. Because they're exposed to lots of elements with the weather. And excessive heat all the time. So the wires can become brittle. Connectors can be covered with sediment from the road. So that's a very low cost way of trying to troubleshoot a situation where your oxygen sensor or your oxygen sensor heater are not getting ready. Because if those two monitors don't get ready, your catalyst monitor is not going to set. And as a helpful tip, if you have a later model Isuzu like the Sender, you want to try to focus more on the GM drive cycle because some of those Isuzu vehicles like the Ascender were actually made by GM. So I'll have a video link down below for that. Hey guys, really quick, if you're finding this video to be helpful and you're enjoying the content, please consider hitting that thumbs up button and subscribing to the channel as well as it lets YouTube and me know that I'm doing a good job and bringing you guys value content. Thanks. And once your monitors are set, you're ready to now go and get the vehicle smogged. Remember, if your vehicle is a 96 through 99 vehicle, you will have to get the vehicle tested on a dyno at 15 and 25 miles an hour. They're going to use a gas analyzer to test the vehicle's emissions. They're going to test your gas cap. They'll do some other tests. And they're also going to do a visual even if you have a 2000 and newer vehicle, they're going to do a visual. But on a 2000 and newer vehicle, they're just going to check for the OBD2 readiness. So they're going to plug in their OBD2 reader into the vehicle from the state and check the monitors. Remember, the visual inspection consists of checking for altered parts like cold air intakes, throttle spacers, cracked vacuum hoses, missing catalytic converters. They're going to do a visual smoke test to make sure that you don't have clouds of smoke coming out the tailpipe. And as of the end of 2020, this is the current rules here for California. And California happens to be one of the stricter states. So you have to check the regulations for your own state. Here in California, if you have a 96 through 99 vehicle, you can have any one monitor show incomplete and still pass. Now, 
depending on the smog station, they may just go ahead and plug in their OBD2 reader. It's not connected to the state. See that you have a monitor that's incomplete and tell you to keep driving because they don't want anything to come back to them to show that on their record for the shop showing that they passed X amount of vehicles with unset monitors. So if that happens to you, go to another station. And if you have a 2000 and newer vehicle, only the EVAP could be unset. And with diesel powered vehicles, 98 through 2006, basically all the monitors have to show complete. On newer diesel vehicles, 2007 and newer, you can have any two monitors show incomplete. And remember when you're selling a car, it's the seller's responsibility to make sure that they supply the buyer with a smog certificate. And normally there's no way of waiving this requirement unless you're selling to a dealer or dismantler. So even if you write as is on the title, that doesn't really mean anything because if it goes to court, you're most likely going to lose that suit unless they're a dealer or dismantler. And if you're a buyer, never buy a vehicle unless all the inspection monitors are ready. And 99% of the times, if the inspection monitors are not ready, is because somebody has erased that check engine light on purpose to cover up an existing issue, whether it's a dealer or a private seller. And 1% of the time is caused by a weak or faulty battery and if this is the case you still have to find out why that battery is dying because you could have a potential short you could have an alternator and when there's a bad battery in a vehicle all kinds of funny things start happening from smog emissions monitors not getting ready to transmissions acting up and it's a big list of potential issues I'm going to show you guys the configuration on a typical four-cylinder vehicle here. And on a typical four-cylinder vehicle, you have two oxygen sensors and one catalytic converter. So here's the vehicle here. This is the engine. And as the exhaust makes it out, the engine block through the headers, downpipe, and it will go past this upstream oxygen sensor, which is known as the pre-cat oxygen sensor. And then the exhaust will go through the catalytic converter here. Then the downstream or post-cat oxygen sensor will go ahead and get a reading. And the way the computer is able to verify the efficiency of the catalytic converter here is by taking this reading and this reading and comparing them based on the parameters of what the vehicle manufacturer has set up to verify that this, in fact, is working correctly. And after the emissions pass the downstream oxygen sensor, it goes through a little resonator here, down through the tailpipe, through the muffler, and out to the atmosphere. And here on a six cylinder or a cylinder, I'm gonna show you guys a couple of diagrams down here. On these, you can have three or four oxygen sensors, depending on the setup, and one or two catalytic converters. So, if we look at this diagram right here, this is a V6 motor, so it has a total of six cylinders, three on one side, three on the other side, thus making it a V6 motor. And whatever side cylinder number one is located on, that's called bank one. So if you're dealing with an emissions issue and it tells you that sensor one on bank two is bad or acting up, you can look at the opposite side of cylinder one and know that it's the opposite side this sensor right here that may potentially need to get replaced so we have one two three oxygen sensors on this vehicle and one catalytic converter and this too is a v6 motor the only difference is the cylinder number one is located on the lower side here and this is bank one and now this is bank two and here on this setup here, this is a V6 motor, and we have a total of six cylinders again, three on one side, three on the other side. But now we have one, two, three, four oxygen sensors, and one, 
two catalytic converters. And if it was a V8, it would just have an extra cylinder on each side. And here's my top eight tips to pass an emissions test. The very first one is going to be make sure that you smog right the very first time. So if you know your vehicle has an issue, you want to make sure to get that issue fixed before you try to go and smog the vehicle. And you should never really fail an emissions test because with these simple scan tools, you can verify that all the monitors are ready. And before you go to the station, you can just do a simple plug-in and it'll let you know that the car's inspection monitors are ready. And you can do this with confidence, knowing that you're going to go and pass now because any failed emissions data will get reported to Carfax and AutoCheck. And this can actually reduce the value of your vehicle. Number two, you want to make sure that the check engine line is off but working. So before you purchase a vehicle, put the key in the ignition and turn it to the very last position and verify that the check engine light is there. And I've seen people actually remove the check engine light. Three, this really helps with those 96 through 99 vehicles. You want to make sure that the tires are properly inflated as this will lessen the load and will allow vehicle better operations the same thing with the oil here the oil actually contains a lot of the hydrocarbons and since they're going to be doing a real emissions test using a gas analyzer you want to make sure you reduce the hydrocarbon numbers here and this is a simple oil change and tip five you want to go ahead and take the vehicle for a very long test drive before you reach the emission station and leave the car on if possible before you get it tested with the emissions probe. Tip number six, use some fuel additives. I personally love the Lucas Oil upper cylinder loop. You'll find a link to this in the video box below as well as anything else that I showed you guys in the video. Tip number seven, you want to avoid wet weather and this is not to say that you cannot pass an emissions test with it raining outside however you'll just get much better results if the tires are dry and tip number eight do not disconnect the battery unless you have a battery saver device set up and these are about 15 bucks and basically this will keep your cards computer data your clocks your radio stations all in sync and remember, the only real solution oftentimes is to repair or replace the component. So there's no such thing as a miracle in a bottle. But if you're looking for a quick fix for your catalytic converter, just because maybe you don't have the time or money to go and have that issue fixed, I have a couple of videos down in the video box below that cover such products and I'll give you guys my honest and truthful review of them and some preventative tips here I love doing everything myself so if you can try doing some of the simpler repairs yourself like the engine oil changes transmission fluids differentials changing the filters the engine air filter the cabin air filter the fuel filter if you clean your throttle body change the wipers and do the brakes on your own vehicle. This is such a nice thing to start doing because the more you learn about a vehicle, the better off you're going to be as far as taking care of it. And what I have found out from my own experience of working on cars over the last 27 years is the time that I actually save doesn't even compare to the amount of money because a lot of people will go and get their oil changed at the dealer and that could take one hour or two hours. Most of the times I'm able to change the oil on my vehicle in under 15 minutes. So not only did I save between 60 to 80 bucks, but I saved myself at least 45 minutes of not having to wait around and I got it done and I can go move on with my life. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If it was helpful, please comment down below and let me know how it went. And if you need additional help, please check out the Smog Tips playlist that will be displayed here at the end. And on that playlist, I cover everything from how to go ahead and get around aging and worn out catalytic converters to how you can buy a catalytic converter for cheap. 
for dirt cheap actually so i have those links and videos at the end of this thanks again so much for watching the video if you guys are new to the channel consider hitting that subscribe button in the bottom right hand corner there's going to be a little bell there too and that's a notification icon so anytime i post videos that are aimed to save you time and money you guys will get notified have a great day